creator God, source of all being. We place ourselves today in your holy presence. We ask you to open our hearts and minds to each other and to what you're saying to each of us through this presentation today. Help us to embrace and further the synodal process by speaking and truly listening with honesty and humility and great love. May it bring hope and healing to our wounded church. We continue to pray for the victims and survivors of sexual abuse. May all who have been abused in any way by your church ministers be respected and receive real justice and authentic reparation. May we be beacons of Christ's healing light and compassion to them, to their families, and to all the world. Amen. We acknowledge that many of the lands we live, work, and meet on are the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples across this country. As shepherds, it is our responsibility to learn about and acknowledge our colonial history and the ways in which we may continue to perpetrate it. As people of faith working for justice, we are called to learn how we are to respond to the calls of action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how we can support Indigenous peoples across this land we know as Canada. And our CLC Statement of Solidarity. We stand in solidarity with all victims of clergy sexual abuse. We are moved by compassion to reflect deeply on the suffering of our wounded brothers and sisters and to pray for them always. We make a commitment to educate ourselves and others about the devastating impact of this scandal on our church. We promise to promote justice and healing for victims and their families and for all those injured by this betrayal of our deepest values. We commit ourselves to the transformation of church structures and clerical culture that put protecting the institution above justice for victims and accountability for offenders. We rely on God in all of this, asking that we be sustained in this commitment we have made. Our speaker today, Dr. Tony Hanna, graduated with a PhD degree in theology from Queen's College, Maynooth, Ireland. He is the author of numerous articles on religious issues and a number of books, including With Respect, Authority in the Church, Columba Press, New Ecclesial Movements, Alba Press, and Dear James Anthony, Why I Want You to Be Catholic, Veritas Press. He has worked full-time in the church for the last 40 years. He served as Senior Education Consultant and Director of the Postgraduate Diploma in Spirituality at the Marino Institute of Education and Associated College of Trinity College, Dublin. He has been for many years Director of the Office of Pastoral Renewal and Family Ministry and Coordinator of the Pastoral Plan for the 61 parishes of the Archdiocese of Armagh. He has worked extensively with parish councils, lay formation, priest conferences, and religious congregations all across Ireland. Dr. Hannah is a co-founder of a new ecclesial movement, the Family of God. As a commentator noted in a review of one of his books, quote, these ecclesial movements are essentially lay movements that emerged from and solidified the ecclesiology of Vatican II. The commentary goes on to say that, quote, Dr. Hanna suggests that the chief characteristics of these ecclesial movements is a strong sense of renewal, which leads to a real discovery of the energy and vitality of the Christian life in the church, end of quote. The challenge for these ecclesial lay movements, indeed, for all lay initiatives, 
is to be provided support from the organizational, communal, and ministerial structures of the institutional church. The theme of co-responsibility is one that Pope Francis has often articulated. What does co-responsibility mean for lay members of the church if, it's, if it is to have any meaningful significance? Do the current structures enable it? This is a subject that Dr. Hanna will address in his talk on a new expression of church, synodality, co-responsibility structure. So the floor now is to Dr. Tony Hanna. Thanks very much, Gary. And first of all, good to be with you. As you probably can see from the lighting, it's just uh, becoming dark here in Ireland. We're about five, maybe five, six hours ahead of you. Uh, but it's really good to be with you. And uh, it's one of the wonders of technology now that uh, from so many disparate places we can be together. And um, we know that Christ's promise is eternal, that wherever two or three come together in my name, I am there in the midst. And maybe just as we begin, it, it's, it's wonderful to see a group like yourselves because uh, it's one of the things that whatever theology taught me, that we can never be church on our own. We can only be church when at least two or three come together. It's, uh, you know, even God himself is fundamentally family. And if we want to understand what church is, we have to try in some way engage with the mystery and the beauty that is the family of God. And uh, although Beverly led us in a lovely prayer, but uh, I'm going to begin with a short prayer too, and maybe just give a little bit of background to that. I'll just bring this up first. This is an icon of the Trinity, probably the, one of the most famous icons that was ever, well, we would paint, but iconographer would say an icon is not painted, you write an icon, or more specifically, you pray an icon into being. It would be quite normal for an iconographer to uh, create, pray, write, paint the icon in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. And uh, there's a real tradition around how this is done. All the ingredients are natural. Uh, the style is, is uh, very traditional. Uh, and they would say that if you have a problem or you come across a difficulty, the solution is to go back and spend some more time in prayer before you return to it. This particular icon painted by a Russian iconographer called Rublev captures a moment in the Old Testament where at the tree of Mamre, Abraham is visited by three strangers. And we understand the three strangers in some way to be forerunners of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, as was customary within the desert community, Abraham shows them hospitality. He gets his wife, Sarah, who's an elderly woman at the time, long past childbearing age. He gets her to go and prepare food and drink for the three guests. And it's interesting that one of the major moments in the history of salvation then occurs. Because in reward for that gesture of hospitality, the guests promise that Sarah, long past childbearing years, will become pregnant. And a significant step on the story of salvation unfolds. So this is what the, the icon attempts to capture. In the middle of the icon, you'll see just behind the central figure, an image of a tree. And that's meant to be a representative of the tree of Mambre and also representative of the tree of life and of course the tree of the cross. Every icon is replete with imagery. I happen to know a little bit about it because a good friend of mine was chairperson of the Irish iconographers, Lord of mercy on him, he has died since. But as we look at the three figures, the one on the left is meant to represent the Father. The one in the middle is Jesus, and the one on the right is the Holy Spirit. And if you look, all figures are the same size. There's equality. Their heads are inclined respectfully towards each other. There is a circular movement. There is no beginning and no end. 
you will see that the central figure represented of Jesus, the two fingers pointing to the table are meant to be representative of the two testaments. You will see also a chalice in the center of the table. But if you look at the full picture of the icon, you should be able to see a larger chalice. I don't know if you can see this, but if you, if you trace, see where my finger is going now, you'll see there's a big chalice which encompasses the smaller chalice. And that makes the point that not only is Jesus the one who is offering the chalice, but he is also the one being offered. And at the foot of the table, there's a little square box. We know that's representative of the altar. And you know, traditionally we put the, the bones or some relic of saints in our altars to show that they're sacred places. But what is happening in the Trinity, there is a perfect ongoing conversation going on among the three of them. They're in perfect communication with one another. A Greek term for this kind of communication is perichoresis, which literally means dancing together. So there's a dance going on continually among the three persons of the Trinity. And their eternal conversation keeps us alive. You and I at this very moment are breathing, are here because some way the very breath that we breathe is being given to us by the Father, Son, and Spirit. So we have been breathed into existence by the Trinity. We're being held at the moment by the Trinity. There is perfect communication going on between the three of them. And this little space at the base of the altar there is our opportunity to in some way enter that sacred space and listen to what they are saying. And that was part of the prayer that Beverly began with tonight, that we would listen to what God is trying to say to us through this engagement this evening. And as well as speaking to you, I'm also trying to listen to what God is saying to me. And as part of my preparation for being with you tonight, I've tried to pay attention to a number of things that have happened to me over the last few days in particular, to try and tune in to what God is saying. We have a little story in Ireland about two people who meet in the middle of a town. One is a country fella and the other is a city guy. And the country fella says to the city guy in the middle of, let's say, Dublin, where there's huge traffic going on, he says, he stops and he says, did you hear the sound of the grasshopper? And the, the kind of city fella says, to the grasshopper, how in the name of God could you hear anything in the middle of this traffic and all this noise. Country fella says, no, there's a grasshopper here. And he stoops down onto the pavement and in his cupped hands, he brings up, sure enough, a small little grasshopper. And the city fella is amazed. How in the name of God did you hear that? And the town fella says, or the, the country fella says, it's very simple, watch. And he takes a coin out of his pocket and he tosses the coin. And as the coin hits the pavement, lots of people stop. So the moral of that little story is, it all depends on what your ear is attuned to. What am I tuned into? What am I hearing? I'm going to play a little piece of music now. And the background to this is, it's an old Gaelic prayer, a prayer that was originally written in Gaelic in Scotland. And you know, the Scottish people share something with Irish people and that were part of the Celtic tradition. And at one time, we would have all spoken a kind of Gaelic. And we can still understand each other, even though there are some nuances and differences now. But when the English conquered Scotland, they tried to wipe out a lot of the Scottish traditions and a lot of them disappeared. It's similar to what happened in Ireland. But there was a Scottish historian called Carmichael who spent his life trying to garner or gather some of the traditions of the Scottish people that were disappearing, especially some of the spiritual traditions. So he came across a prayer to the Trinity, which was in Gaelic, and he had it translated into English. And a group of, well, a group of sisters, religious sisters who live close by where I am now, poor Clares, 
we've re-established a, a, a convent in a place called Fochert, which was a shrine of St. Bridget, one of the great saints of Ireland, way, way back many centuries ago. And a number of years back, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, they built a new hermitage monastery convent. And one of the sisters, a sister Bree Jo Her, is a very fine musician. And she came across this old Scottish prayer to the Trinity, got it translated into English, and it is sung now by a mercy sister. So this is something from the past, which we are hearing in a new way in the present. So I want to listen, you to listen to this as, as we begin. It will have a bearing on the talk that I'm going to speak about a little bit later on. So I'm just going to invite you for a moment or two to listen to this. Maybe just as we begin, where you are quietly, to yourself, 
we might just say the first seven or eight lines quietly as our own prayer for this evening, uh, because it really captures what we should all be trying to do. So maybe just quietly say the first seven or eight lines to yourself there as we begin. Okay, uh, this is what something of what I'm trying to uh, talk to you about this evening. We're not going to get half of it done, but anyhow, um, we'll see where it takes us. The slides that are here tonight, uh, I will make them available. So what you see on screen, uh, and even perhaps some of what you don't see on screen, if we don't get it finished, I will send it on to Cathy and she can distribute it to those who want it uh, afterwards. So, this is a kind of overview of what some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. It may not necessarily be in the, or the order that it comes here, but hopefully it will kind of weave in and out and the pattern will, will begin to begin to emerge. OK, so you can see these are some of the things that uh, we, we hope to, to touch on as we go along. Now, yesterday I, I sat on the board for the John of Gods, which is an interesting kind of John of God Brothers, which is about to be handed over in its entirety to a lay reality. I, I'll get a wee chance maybe to talk about that at the end in terms of new structures that are coming down the tracks. But at the board meeting yesterday, one of the brothers shared this with, with us and uh, I was quite taken by it. So I asked him to send it on to me. So it's a book by a man called Ted Dunn, whom I don't know and I haven't read the book, but this was in the preface. So that's a text confirmed for me some of the things that uh, I was thinking of saying to you tonight. And one of those things that I wanted to pay attention to uh, was a thing called a paradigm shift, which I think is happening in our church at the moment. But again, just to sensitize you to this before we begin, just I want you to watch this. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So that's just by way of uh, getting us to pay attention and to realize that sometimes we don't see what we're supposed to see and things pass us by because there's something in our makeup or our psyche that causes us only to see that with which we agree or that which confirms the positions that we already hold. And this is part of the difficulty that we all are taught to deal with when we come across what's called a paradigm shift. And I've just given you an example of some of these. You're familiar with Mark's gospel, where there's a line which is quite striking. All of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out into the, de the desert to see and hear John. Now I want you, that might just seem perhaps uh, an example of hyperbole, or a bit of exaggeration <coughs> of the part of Mark. But those of you who've done a wee bit of study of Mark's gospel will know that Mark is a very succinct, very sharp writer, the shortest of all the gospels, never wastes words because the whole focus of Mark's gospel is Jesus moving rapidly towards Jerusalem. So Mark cuts out all extraneous material and it's a very deeply focused gospel. So nothing is put in by accident. So 
exaggeration and things like that would not be part of his style. So here's this line, all of Jerusalem, all of Judea are heading out into the desert to see John. Now, if you know the context of Jerusalem at the time or Judea at the time, that's quite shocking. Because the only place where people met Jesus or met God or the divinity was in the temple. And the minister whereby you met God at that time was the chief priest or the priest, certainly not a layman and certainly not in the midst of the desert. So that would have been quite a shocking statement that people were leaving what would be known as sacred ground or hallowed ground and going into the wilderness to encounter to find God. That would have been really upsetting the structure of the religion then. So a major paradigm shift is being heralded by that. Monasticism, maybe fourth, fifth century, third, fourth, fifth century, where people began to go out into the desert and eschew or eschew the, the normal way of life to have a deeper communion with God would be another example. The mendicant orders in the Middle Ages were instead of people living in parochial territories and diocesan structures. Now we had people who were traveling all around the place, like the Franciscans and the Dominicans. And this was very difficult for the guys who were living in more stable situations because these newcomers were threatening their way of life and threatening, more importantly, their income because itinerant preachers were able to go wherever they wanted. And there was a big battle in the churches as to whether they should be allowed. But again, another major paradigm shift. The arrival of religious congregations, maybe the 18th, 19th century in particular, another example of huge things changing. The new ecclesial movements that Gary referred to in his introduction of myself, um, again, shocking in how they arrived and the unexpected nature of that arrival and the upheaval that they have caused and are continuing to cause in the life of the church. Hopefully a little bit more about that later on. And another major paradigm shift, and this is one of the things that I would argue is happening in the church at the moment, is the recovery of new mythology. New mythology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and for the ladies among us, it's good to know that uh, at one stage, the, the, the Hebrew word for spirit was ruah, or U-A-H. It got translated into Latin as new, uh, uh, sorry, it got translated into Greek as pneuma, and then into Latin as spiritus. It's a very interesting development of language. Rua, which is uh, Hebrew, is feminine. Pneuma in Greek is neutral, and spiritus in Latin is male. So it's a very interesting uh, examination of language how the Holy Spirit moved from a feminine word to a neutral word to now a masculine word. But the recovery of pneumatology, the, the understanding that uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who keeps the church alive and breathes life into the church. Uh, that is a major development at the moment. Uh, and it's against that backdrop that the main paradigm shift at the moment is taking place. You could argue in theological terms that Christology for most of our lives has been the dominant ology. And that has very often been at the expense of pneumatology. It's interesting when I, I'm, I was a layman who went back to uh, study theology. I was studying theology initially with seminarians. I was the only layman in the group at the time. And I had come from a background where I had become part of this little community and was very much kind of, uh, had found myself there, I think, through the action of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and yet, pneumatology was not taught in the formal seminary formation. Mariology, eschatology, liturgy, Christology, anyology you can think of. But pneumatology was not taught in the main seminary in Ireland. And I would suspect, and I know that we have spiritans among us, uh, but I would suspect that if you were to examine many of the uh, theology faculties in the universities or indeed the pontifical universities across the world, pneumatology still would be considered a Cinderella subject. And it's a, a phrase that has actually been used about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit for too long has been the Cinderella member 
of the of the of the of the Trinity. Okay, so that's part of the, the background that's taken in terms of paradigm shifts. This is a quote from Neil Walsh, and some of you may have read. Again, I'll let you read it. This is a, a book in Ireland by, he was a former priest, a man by the name of Donald Harrington. And when he spoke about tomorrow's parish, he, this book with me maybe about seven or years ago it came out. But he said the current situation, the church, there are people who want to ignore it. The ostrich put their head in the sand. There are people who want to give out about the situation. Oh, it's dreadful the way young people are today. It's dreadful that people aren't getting married. It's horrible that... There seems to be a terrible loss of, uh, of a religious fervor among the young and they're, they give out about the reality. And then there are others who wish we could go back. If we only could go back to the security and the stability of the 1950s or the church we grew up in when there was full church attendance or lots of priests, lots of nuns and brothers and everything seemed to be in its proper place. Now, Harrington would say the first three we waste energy by staying there. It's a bit like going back to the previous slide. There's no future in, in those realities. There's no future there. We're, it's a waste of energy. Each one of those is a cul-de-sac. The only hope for the church for today and for tomorrow is for those who are willing to explore. Where is the Holy Spirit leading us? Christ keeps talking about launching out into the deep. So where are we being led to go today? A paradigm shift, or a paradigm, first of all, is, is a pattern which establishes boundaries. And people who know the rules of boundaries become the experts in that paradigm. When a shift takes place, it happens at the periphery, normally. And with that comes a change of boundaries and a new pattern. And this is disconcerting, particularly for the experts, because they are now disempowered. The skills, the rules that they had learned, the application of those rules that they were the experts in no longer apply. Now, this is not just this, this is not just for the church, this is for any organization. But the church, as well as being divine, we believe that, it also has a human face. And although church is fundamentally mystery. It, has, it is a human reality as well, and it's the human reality very often that finds paradigm shifts difficult to handle. Uh, Jesus himself was a perfect exemplar of the paradigm shift being broken. It has, it has been said, past tense, but I say to you, present tense and future. So one of the things that is happening at the moment, and I, I hope to get to this maybe at the end of the talk, we grew up in a model of church where the Petrine model of church, that is the, the priestly model, the kind of the hierarchical model was very dominant. The institution was very strong. We knew the rules and the regulations and power, if you like, and authority and the ministry, all of that was kind of largely um, de devolved to the priestly, the priestly caste. Uh, uh, the church was looked after by the experts, and the experts were those who had taken ordination or were part of religious life. Lord be good to my own mother, a good Northern Catholic. She would say about a priest or a nun or a brother, father or sister, they have received the higher calling. Would you have heard that kind of language? I presume some of you might have. Now, it, it, was, it was meant as an accolade. It was, a, it was meant as an affirmation a recognition of a life given over to the service of God. But it also did a great disservice because if someone received a higher calling, it follows that others have received a lower calling. And that belief system became ingrained. First of all, it gave rise to what we would now know as clericalism, that there was an elite group looking after the church. It was their responsibility. And it also gave rise to a disempowerment and a malaise on the part of laity 
that this was not uh, our responsibility. By the way, just a little aside here. We have, we have the, the Greek word for laity is laikos, L-A-I-K-O-S, laikos. Our first hearing of this word happened in a letter uh, by a pope, Pope Clement, around 100 AD, I think. And I, I may not have the date exactly right. This just comes to me as I'm talking to you. But it was around that time for the, we had the use of the word laikos for the first time. In the early life of the church, everyone who belonged to Christianity, who followed Christ, were known as the kleros, K-L-E-R-O-S in Greek, kleros. Now, kleros meant and still means the holy ones, the holy ones. Now, we can see where we get our English word cleric from. But originally, anyone who belonged to Christ was part of the kleros. But for the first time in the, around 100 AD, that began to split. And now for the first time, we had the kleros and we had the lykos. And there was a difference. The kleros were holier than the lykos. And if you read through the history of early spirituality, early spirituality, or even right up to modern times, that division persisted. And uh, there was those who were holier than, than, than others. Now, thankfully, that kind of thing is beginning to change. Karl Rahner, the great German Jesuit theologian, said the following. Now, Sometimes we grew up thinking mystics were people like John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, or indeed today is the feast day of uh, the little flower, St. Teresa. And so people like that, we assume they were mystics. They were kind of very special people who were given particular and maybe peculiar access to God, privileged access to God. But Rana was saying, and Rana was writing this probably in the 1960s, that uh, anyone who's going to be a Christian going forward will be a mystic or they won't be a Christian. And that's more or less saying that each of us has to have our own personal encounter with Christ. And it's been my privilege over many years now working with lay people, hearing stories. Of, I, we used to run a theology program in the diocese, a degree program, and many people presenting would not have had formal education because they would have left school early or they hadn't got the requirements to go to university. And we would have an interview with them to say, well, now, why do you want to do this program at this stage of your life or whatever? And almost I had the opportunity then to hear lots of life stories of people. And it was a privilege just to hear people talking about how they had encountered God. And um, just one comes to mind, just to share that by way of an example. There was a, a woman who told me that her her mother was very ill, her mother was dying. And her daughter, who was uh, not married at the time, was expecting, and she was in England. And her daughter was about to uh, give birth to her child. Her mother was in hospital dying, and she was caught as to who she should go to serve. But because it was her only daughter and the circumstances that she felt, I need to go to England. So she went. And her prayer to God was, and she prayed, very deep woman, a deep, uh, prayerful woman, this, and she prayed to God that uh, to protect her mother till she got back, look after her mother. And of course, you can almost guess what happened when she went to England to help deliver the, or be with her daughter, her mother died. And it became a real crisis of faith for her. And she said she battled with it and angry tears and lots of upset, but she said on one occasion, she was in the chapel praying on her own. And she said to God, I, my mother was an orphan. She, her own mother had died early when she was young. She had a very hard life. And she said, I asked that, that, that uh, you would allow someone to be there. I would be there for her when she died. And she said, as clear as a bell in the quiet of the chapel, she heard a voice say, but I was there. Mm -hmm. and that changed everything and she would have had that, that now she wouldn't have used that language but that was a kind of a mystical encounter where she met God and knew that God had spoken to her 
And with that came peace and acceptance and real desire to know this God even deeper. It was a great line given to me once in a retreat. Um, Philip Pinto, I don't know if you've come across him. Philip Pinto was the first non-Irish leader of the Christian brothers. His own parents were Zoroastrian, kind of an Eastern religion, astrologers. They reckon uh, one of the Magi was a Zoroastrian, so it goes back as far as that. And he was a first generation Christian and then became, and they became a Christian brother and then became the leader of the Christian brothers worldwide. I did a retreat with him one, uh, one Advent. And in the middle of the retreat, he stopped and said to us, which was a wonderful question. I'm going to give it to you tonight too. What do you know about God that you didn't read in a book or someone else tell you? It's a great question. What do you know about God that you didn't read in a book or someone else tell you? Now, the little story I just told you about that woman, that's something she knows about God. That's, that's a direct communication between her and God. That's the mystic experience that Rana is talking about. And I think that's the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's much, much more prevalent than we think. And I think as part of the mission of the church <clears throat> going forward to affirm that, to protect that, to encourage that, and to nurture that intimate relationship that we have with the Father, Son, and Spirit. The little icon and the music that I played at the start, in some way is, is the opening that up. How do we listen to what God is saying to us? That's an example of a woman who heard it. What do you know about God? that you didn't read in a book or someone else. It's not secondhand, it's immediate, it's firsthand. How do, how do we hear that? St. Teresa Mavala said this, I was born for you, Lord. This was, one of the, that was the first line in one of her uh, diary entries. And then the second, what do you ask of me? Uh, it's quite interesting even to own that, even to say that quietly. I was born for, I was born at this time, this moment, now. I was born for you, Lord. What do you ask of me? That's the kind of conversation of the mystic. Now, this is you're familiar with. This was the pre-Vatican II church structure. I, I'm not going to spend much time in it, but uh, if you look at, the, at the, the right-hand side, you see the strengths. You're familiar with it. And the left-hand side would be the weaknesses, if you like, of that structure. So that's, that's kind of pre-Vatican II up to the early 1960s. And then, of course, the pyramid was turned upside down. In theory, we all began as people of God and then the, the servant of the servants of God. So it's meant to be that way now, that we all come out of our baptism. And this is actually what's happening in the moment in the background. Ordination within our church became, rightly or wrongly, the, 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 well, wrongly we'd say it now, but became the, the, the dominant kind of sacrament for ministry. That to minister, you had to be ordained, or at least professed. Those of you who maybe have worked in the church will know that for a time it was probably considered inconceivable that a lay person could use the word minister. And again, um, I just heard this just this week, actually. Some of you may have come across the work of Richard Galliardetz. Have you heard of him? He was professor of ecclesiology at Boston University, Boston College. Galliardis is one of the great writers today on modern ecclesiology, which is the study of the church or our understanding of the church. Brilliant speaker, brilliant writer. Um, but I was at a conference he had in Ireland a number of years ago, and he and I had a little, uh, not confrontation quite, but a disagreement. Um, Richard felt that uh, ministry is a term that should still <clears throat> largely be applied only to the ordained or the professed. And, um, I remember a friend of mine, a layman who did a lot of work in the church, 
uh, wrote books on parenting, a man called, by the name of Mickey Quinn. And I remember Mickey saying once that getting up at two o'clock in the morning to give a little baby a bottle of milk or to change his or her nappy. He said, if that is not ministry, I don't know what is. And he went on to quote uh, Jesus, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. And uh, I remember speaking to Richard Galliard about it and saying, uh, Richard felt that it was only installed uh, ministers could use the term minister. And I was reminded of uh, the second Eucharistic prayer. <coughs> Excuse me. In Latin, we have an old saying, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. And that means the law of prayer is the law of belief, is the law of life. More modern translation would be how we pray is what we believe is how we live. And in the second Eucharistic prayer, there's a line which says, Lord, uh, we give you thanks that we are worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. So we all are part of that. That's what we say in mass. That's, that's the, the, the law of our liturgy is the law of belief, is the law of how we live. So enshrined in our liturgy is a validation that all of us are called to ministry. And that's the backdrop at the moment of what is happening in the church. There's a burgeoning of the dignity of baptism, a validation or a re-understanding that in baptism, we are all called to ministry without exception. Now, as that ministry burgeons and grows, and if lay people take up the responsibilities that come with that, that unfortunately for the moment brings us into tension with the ordained priesthood. Things that formerly were reserved only for priests uh, are no longer so. The, the three exceptions, of course, being the uh, Eucharist, confession, and uh, anointing. And by the way, even anointing is now under pressure in terms of many of the chaplains in hospitals now are laymen or religious, not necessarily ordained. And because of the shortage of priests, we're saying, uh, well, if, who will bring the sacrament to the sick? And again, the other question sometimes asked is, if I'm the person in country, the sick one all the time, and I'm ministering to them, caring for them, it's somewhat strange if someone then comes from, in, from outside at the very end and, and uh, offers the sacrament only. Does that devalue the sacrament in some way? But many of the things that formerly had been the domain of priests are now no longer so. Think of baptism. Anyone, more and more baptisms are not carried out now by priests. Uh, burials, funerals, increasingly because of shortage of priests, not carried out by priests. Weddings, just think of that. You and I, I, was, I understood that father so-and-so married me. And now the new understanding of theology of, of, uh, of the sacrament of marriage is that we confer the sacrament on each other. I confer the sacrament on my wife, she confers it on me. The, the priest is merely a witness. I don't mean merely, I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way, but the central ministers of the sacrament are the husband and wife, the man and the woman. And even now where marriage is witnessed, it's very often by a deacon. And you don't need a priest necessarily to validate the sacrament of, of marriage. And again, so, so again, the kind of questions that that raises, and by the way, just to know that sacrament marriage was the last of the sacraments to be approved by the church. Within the Protestant tradition, it is still not considered a sacrament, in most of the Protestant traditions anyhow. And, and again, one of the questions that arises at the moment is, if a couple confer the sacrament on each other, what about those couples who live together, apparently at one time called in state of sin, but if a young couple decide to set up home together and live together, have they conferred the sacrament on each other already if they are faithful and loyal and committed to each other? I, I put that as a question. I'm not making that as a statement. But are they not a long way towards fulfilling the sacrament of marriage? Uh, that's, another, that's another debate for another day. But, uh, okay. 
So this is, these are some of the sacred spaces of today. Uh, for some people, the temple or the church is still. For some people, it's home. You can read People find it on the web, uh, new technology. People find all kinds of resources. That's one of the things that COVID uh, brought to the fore, where, where more and more people began to use technology this morning. Uh, and I didn't get out to mass here in, in town, so my wife and I went to mass in Medjugorje today. It just happened to someone sent us a link who's there on pilgrimage. And uh, the mass was in English, and we went to mass from Medjugorje today. And they, the chief minister, there were about 15, 20 priests concelebrated, and the chief minister was a, a bishop from Nigeria. So again, that's one of the, 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 the gifts of technology. Some people find God in nature. Some people find him in school. Again, one of the issues for young people is that perhaps their last encounter with formal religion takes place in school. And once they leave school, certainly a Catholic school, there's no future connection with the church. The old joke is how, uh, you know, but confirmation. How do you get rid of church mice? You confirm them. And that's the kind of one of the old jokes we have here at the moment in, in Ireland. Some people find God in music, in relationships. Again, even week, about and finding God in sport, affirming that. And for many people, it's on a pilgrimage, like my friend in Medjugorje at the moment, or some people uh, will find God in, in, in family and, and the love of uh, family. I met a young woman on one occasion in part of my work, and she used a very interesting phrase that I've always held on to. She said, in matters spiritual, I am a soul trader. It caught my attention. A young woman in her mid-20s. So she was more or less saying that uh, you know a soul trader looks after their own financial affairs and doesn't trust anyone else. And again, I think that captures the, the zeitgeist of the moment, that for many young people, that's what they are about. In matter spiritual, I'm a soul trader. And there's a modern day uh, sociologist says that we're living in liquid modernity. Things are very fluid. Nothing will stay. And by the way, that's one of the structural changes I think that will certainly take place. Um, the things that we have taken for granted in terms of the structures within our church are collapsing as we speak. I don't know what it's like in, in Canada, but certainly in Ireland, um, we have we no longer have, uh, put, it, put it very mildly, the birth weight of a priest is far exceeding, is far, is far below the death rate. We have an aging uh, population of priests. The same applies within our religious sisters. So a lot of our structures that were formerly carried by them are now disappearing or in, imploding. Ireland, which was formerly a country of emigration, has now become a country of destination. And we have an increasing number of foreign uh, priests and brothers and uh, and sisters in particular coming and while that can be a blessing in some ways it also creates difficulties because uh, there are cultural and language problems that have exacerbated the, the decline in, in people's participation in what we might have called the, the formal structures of church okay so just for we look at the moment at the role of a priest this is one of the significant changes that's taking place very rare now to have mass church attendance. And if you think at one time, people came to the church all the significant events of their life. A priest married you, a priest baptized you, a priest married you, a priest buried you. You made your first communion, you made your first confession, you yeah, got confirmation. A lot of things happened in church. People came to the church to be catechized. Uh, you had novenas, you had all kinds of things, you had retreats, all things happened within the structure of the church. The priest can no longer be the focal point from everything. One of the changes is that the priest now is going to move from the apex to the center. He's not going to be top of the pyramid anymore. He, would, he will have to be somewhere in the center still, still pivotal for the life of the church, but it will be a different kind of priesthood. <clears throat> An animator, a conductor of an orchestra. I, I came across that once, which I thought was a lovely definition of leadership. He, I can't think of the man's name now, but he was a former leader of the Philharmonic Orchestra in New York. 
And he said in the interview, I remember uh, he said, he said, I, I had a seminal moment, he said, when I suddenly realized I've been teaching for so many years and conducting, when I suddenly realized I was the only person in the orchestra who didn't play a musical instrument. And this was the line that caught me. He said, my job was to make other people powerful. Wow. And I, I thought that was a lovely definition of leadership. My job was to make other people powerful. And I think I've used this phrase very often, uh, very regularly now with priests in my own diocese. I think more that's the role of the priest going forward. How do I make other people powerful, recognize their gifts and call those gifts forth? So the call of forth of gift to this now, and this is a much more difficult theological question. And I I just pose it as a question. I'm not giving a judgment on it yet because I have mixed feelings in myself around it, but I ask it because I think it's, it's germane. Will the priest be the leader of the worshiping assembly as opposed to leader of all parish life? At the moment, and you know this from parish pastoral councils, for example, and that uh, I, parish pastoral councils are consultative only. You cannot make any deliberative decision. But what happens, as is about to happen very shortly, where you won't have a priest, where there won't be a, a priest or a parish priest in situ who can make those decisions. And by the way, this is this is relevant to the structure of the church at the moment, because uh, in my work training parish pastoral councils, we discovered this. We had all kinds of difficulties with, with, uh, with priests around this particular matter. Some priests were very happy to devolve. Uh, some degree of governance to lay people, others were very rigid. And you know that under some priests would take the view that when a parish priest stepped down, the parish pastoral council should step down with him. That when a new incumbent came in, it was the right of the parish priest to appoint the new parish pastoral council. He takes this theology from a document called Christus Dominus which was a document written in the 1960s about the role of the bishop, which pertained to the bishop. And the bishop was advised to have a diocesan pastoral council in his diocese. Didn't have to, but it was recommended with as much as possible this should take place, but it was not obligatory. But in that scenario, if the bishop, if the see becomes vacant because the bishop stepped down, the bishop dies, the diocesan pastoral council is disbanded and the new incumbent creates a new one. Now, parish priests on the trickle-down theory, top-down, took that as a kind of a, a, a mandate for a similar thing to happen in parishes. But that is, that is not the case. That's, a, that's an interpretation of canon law, but it is not the case. Uh, that's that's a, an arbitrary kind of decision or an arbitrary interpretation, which can, and I think particularly in this day and age, should be, should be challenged. And one of the interesting things at the moment also is that parish pastoral councils are handled at the moment by the, well, the term, the language has changed. It used to be known as the congregation for the clergy, which would also seem to suggest that parish pastoral councils really are in some way the responsibility of priests. But I think going forward, in all probability, that will probably move to the dicastery of laity, because if there aren't priests in situ, which is increasingly the situation, somebody will have to be responsible. And who will that be? Invariably, it's going to be a layman or a laywoman. If you're interested in this, it's interesting just to see what is happening, particularly in France at the moment. I did a very interesting piece of research there around parishes in France that are trying to move from maintenance to mission, that's a kind of a slogan that you're familiar with. And uh, the new structures that are developing there are, are, are very, very interesting. I might get a chance to say a little bit more about that at the very end if I can, okay? Then the priest is liturgy, which is another delicate matter. Liturgy, by the way, again, translated, means the work of the people. That's what it means. You translate it into English, liturgia is the work of the people, not the work of the priest. The priest has a critical role, he's president, but 
he is not the liturgist. He is not the one who should determine every aspect of liturgy, particularly if you have people who are competent within that realm. It's meant to be the work of the people. The priest has a pivotal role. He's president. Uh, he's got to make sure that things are orthodox, but he, he does not necessarily have, he, he cannot function as a dictator. Uh, I remember, and again, just by way of example of that, I had a situation recently where someone came, a, a couple came, who wanted to have a, a children's liturgy where the children would come out and uh, he said, no, wouldn't even entertain it. So he said, well, look, yeah, that's a, if he doesn't, then you should, you should really bring that to the bishop. You have, and the people who were proposing to do it were uh, primary school teachers who were taking kind of first communion classes, what have you, in good standing with the church as well. So um, this is where someone was, uh, dictating in a way that uh, they, they, they should not have been. So someone who sees liturgy as the work of, of the people. Uh, and again, obviously some of these things we're talking about will require ongoing adult faith formation. That's a huge thing going forward for the church, how we, how we do that. We need to move from the cultic model of priesthood and apart to someone who's community centered among the people. A returning missionary said, was asked once, what's the difference between the church in the third world and the church here? And he was coming from Africa and he said, well, he said in Africa, he said, the priest helps the people. Here, the people help the priest. So the priest helps the people, the community of God. The priest needs to become an agent of co-responsibility, not just pay lip service to it. Okay, move on. I'll move on from that. I like this quote. You might just read that quote. It's an old one written in 1978 by a priest. Frank Duff, who some of you know, a founder of the Legion of Mary, an Irishman, and he said this, religion has become routine, terrible conservatism exercises relentless ways and tells the Irish people they must walk by outmoded ways. Again, Frank Duff was no rebel, no revolutionary in one sense. He was a great man of the church, very faithful. And yet, by the way, I discovered something about him that you might be interested in. Okay, we're talking about sexual abuse early on, and I know you have your own kind of uh, horror stories around that, and we have some similar in Ireland. But Duff created a, a mother and child home situation where the mothers were allowed to keep their babies. And some of the mothers went out to work, and others stayed at home and minded the children. But the, the parent, they didn't have to give up their children. And one thing I discovered, which I found absolutely fascinating, was that he actually set up a meeting place, a safe meeting place, home uh, where people of um, uh, homosexual persuasion could meet safely. It, it wasn't necessarily endorsing it, but because they were much abused, he actually set up a place where they could meet safely, which I found fascinating. But he said this in the letter to Father Eben Legrand. And again, I can't, I can't believe how prescient he was. An inert laity is only two generations away from non-practice. A non-practice is only two generations away from non-belief. And uh, I said, by the way, I, I met Cardinal Sunans often and Sunans and, and uh, Frank Duck were friends. And then they split because Frank uh, Sunans kind of left the Legion to take responsibility for charismatic renewal. And Frank Duff found that very difficult to accept. Um, but Cardinal Sunas told me of all the people he'd ever met, the one man he was sure was a saint was Frank Duff. So it's an interesting story. Okay. I'm going to fly through the next part. These slides will be here. But this was a famous statement by, by Benedict uh, XVI who was one of the first to call attention, certainly in my lifetime, to co-responsibility. I know Francis has taken up the, the banner since, 
But this was the provocative statement of Benedict, which caught my attention in 2009. And he makes a distinction between collaboration, which still smacks of, I am allowing you to collaborate. It's an unequal relationship where co-responsibility, like those of you who are parents will know this. My and I, we have four daughters. Now, there are lots of things my wife would do better than me, something I would do better than me. Think, but together we're co-responsible. We couldn't share it. We, we shared it equally and we knew what that meant with the good times and the bad times. And something of that ownership needs to be uh, returned to lay people. Now lay people also have to take that up. We have to, because as you know, many lay people just abdicate that responsibility. And that's where ongoing adult formation needs to take place, where we can not only ask people to claim the responsibility of their baptism, but also to, to accept the responsibilities that come with that. Again, this is not to diminish the responsibility of parish priests. So the question he asks is, to what degree is this made, made possible, uh, especially to lay men and women, is it promoted? I'm gonna jump that. You can read, and he, again, Benedict went on then to talk about a change of mindsets, not just of priest, requires that certainly and religious, but also change of mindset of laity. Um, now, Francis, today, a dream of a missionary option. And again, this is where structural change will come about. A missionary impulse capable of transforming everything. The churches, customs, ways of doing things, time, schedules, languages, structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization, evangelization of the world rather than for self-preservation. So literally, Francis is saying everything is up for grabs. And we see that, if we should see it, very quick. These are the models of governance of a parish in canon law. There are seven. The one on the top left is kind of somewhat peculiar, special, so we will not talk about that. It's where particular rights, the Cyril Malabar right, or maybe the traveling community, a military, that kind of organ, that kind of structure. The other six, the, one on the, the first one on the right-hand side, number one is the old model that we're all have maybe grown up with, one parish, one parish priest. Uh, then number two, parish priest in charge of several parishes. That's becoming much more popular now at the moment. A team of priests, we call it insolidium, with one priest as moderator, but not as parish priest. Some of our dioceses in Ireland are already operating that model. Now, those three are all predicated on priests being in charge. But four, five, and six are all permissible under the 1983 Code of Canon Law. And they are, they are predicated on not having a priest, where somebody else runs them. We have one situation in Ireland at the moment that I'm aware of where a group of nuns have taken over a parish in Limerick with the sanction of the of the, of the bishop. But that's going to be, uh, I think, much more real. Now, it's, it's a question as to why we haven't taken this on board. We've, we've been importing priests. We've been given priests three and four parishes, even though they're like, like absentee landlords in some parishes because just can't do it. And as we as the men get older, it becomes a, a just an impossible workload. But there's a reluctance to operate out of the other three. Now, to some extent, that's a failure to recognize the paradigm shift that has taken place, that something very different is happening and we need to revisit the, the, this kind of structure. And all around parishes, parishes once were territorial. You belonged within a particular territory that was marked out and you paid your dues and you attended that parish church. One of the things that began to happen, particularly with the arrival of the automobile and more uh, accessible travel, is that people began to pick and choose where they would go for their Sunday uh, liturgy. They would go to a place where there's good music, better preacher, nicer people, whatever. And so it became then not so much a territorial parish as a Eucharistic parish. Where did you receive Eucharist? And now what has happened increasingly as a result of COVID is that people are now going to virtual parishes. They're not necessarily physically going to any particular church, 
They're doing what like I did today. They went to mass somewhere. Okay, they didn't get communion, but they were there for the, the basic structure of mass. The new ecclesial movements are beginning to challenge that parish structure too, because they operate super parish. That means beyond parish, and they operate super diocese beyond diocese. Bishops don't like them always because there's a fluidity about them and there's a flexibility which makes it difficult for them to tie them down. And it's one of the blessings uh, that Francis sees about these new movements, that they're able to move quickly and able to move across territory and across nations and countries, um, which in some way speaks to the fluid nature of the world we live in today, a certain flexibility. It's almost like people traveling with a tent rather than put into a, a, a fixed building. And one of the things about the new movements is that that mystical experience I talked about, if you talk to people who belong to these new movements, invariably they will speak about a personal encounter with Christ that has called them to begin to engage in a much more dynamic and public way with people. They, they have a sense of mission that they're called to evangelize. They're called to go out and speak the word. And they, they do that. The danger is that they, they could possibly begin to do that independent of church. A small example from the Anglican community. The Anglican community in England a number of years ago did a thing called the Alpha program that some of you may be familiar with, Alpha. And um, on foot of that, they, they hoped that they would use the Alpha program. It's, it's built around a cafe model where people are invited to come for a meal, maybe a drink. And then there's a, there's a series of talks over six or seven weeks, small group sharings. And they did it for young adults with the hope that at the end of that time, this would encourage young adults to come back to the mainstream church. Young adults came, they loved it, they liked it very much, but they did not want to go back to the mainstream church. They wanted to continue doing what they were doing. And the bishops met and then decided, okay, well, look, this is not what we had planned, but they appointed pastors, ministers, to actually care for this new, more fluid kind, almost like a house church, but the danger was they felt if they remained as house churches, they could drift off into schism or whatever. So this is an effort to try and care for them, but in a much more unstructured way. They, they don't have any big desire to go back to the way church was, was before. Now they call that, and you might like to explore this a bit more, they call that FXCs, FXCs, Fresh Expressions of Church, FXCs. And we could have something like that happening in Ireland too. Okay, I think I, I, I think I'm gonna I could I could do a lot more, Kathy, but I think I'll maybe stop for a while and just see where people are. They've been bombarded with stuff. I'm conscious of that, so I'll maybe take a breather for a moment and uh, just see where 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 people are before I go <laughs> any further. I think I think that you've given us lots of uh, information and some really intriguing, uh, you know, things that I didn't know about that. 1983 code allows for these other ways of governing our parishes. So maybe we could um, open it up and ask if uh, anyone has uh, questions or comments at this point. And then maybe you can weave into the, your responses some of the other things you were going to cover as they come up from the audience. Okay. Any questions or comments? Agnes. So um, I, um, I'm one of the first to jump in when questions are called for, but I can see a direct correlation between both what concerned lay Catholics are doing in the formation that you've um, experienced in the last three or four years and the international Laudato Si movement. The Laudato Si movement um, formed the same year as the Pope's encyclical has exploded globally as a lay-based movement that trans, you know, that crosses all boundaries and all um, levels of the church. You know, the, the triangle that um, that was tipped upside down, that the the, um, the Laudato Si movement touches every aspect of that triangle and every point of the globe. And and the fact that in six or seven years, it has, um, it now counts its members in the tens of thousands, proves to me exactly what 
um, about what your speaker is, is, is saying, um, um, Dr. Tony. So um, I guess my what I'm saying is that we're living that change right now. It, it's happening and, uh, and there is a yearning for it. Okay, thank you. I see a question in the chat from Margaret under number six. What do you mean by lay governance being given faculties of priests? Okay. Um, just to clarify, the 1983 code, the, the normal governance of a parish is given to an ordained priest. That's kind of the, the, the main statute of government that, that exists. And that still exists as the main statute of government. But there's a phrase where a share, in verticom, a share in the governance, a partial share in the governance of parish can be entrusted. So but partial can, doesn't necessarily mean small. It can mean 99.9%. And that's obviously at the discretion of the, the bishop. But it, it seems to me at the moment, given the reality that we face, that it's almost something inevitable that's going to happen, that we have to begin to believe that uh, we can entrust the care of parishes to competent lay men, women, sisters, it'll probably even like sisters and brothers are also beginning to disappear. So they, that the person who would be given that responsibility would have to be installed by the bishop and be accountable to the bishop in some way. And obviously a lay man or woman taking that role would require formation and some kind of a, um, a study. You may be aware that about two or three months ago, the Francis introduced a very interesting document in the Vatican called Predicate Evangelium, where for the first, well, not for the first time, but certainly in, in, in our lifetime and in recent centuries anyhow, a, a leadership of a Vatican congregation, used to be called Vatican congregations, they now call them dicasteries, but it, it's really another word for a department or a congregation can now be entrusted to any of the baptized. That baptism is now the criteria, not ordination. Now that's a seismic shift and change. And uh, if that begins to, if that can happen within the Vatican Curia, it will begin, I believe, to trickle down into other facets of church life as well. It's, it's the one area that the church has been relatively slow to act on. The, you know, in, in our baptism, we're called to be priest, prophet, and king. All of us receive that. Now, uh, the governance, the, the king is the governance bit. And normally, it was kind of ascribed to lay people that they would exercise that governance within their family. So mother and father would have responsibility for, you know, forming their children, governing them, bringing them up right, exercising authority there. Uh, teachers might do it in, in, in a Catholic school. But increasingly, we will begin to look at that perhaps that role of governance is wider than that. It's not just in the secular world, but it could also be in, for want of another word, the, the religious or the spiritual world. We have a couple more questions, Tony. Uh, yeah. Sheila, sorry, Sheila was next, and then Nancy, and then Andrew's question in the chat. We'll do it in that order. Is that okay? Yeah, first of all, Tony, thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed the challenges. I'm wondering if in Ireland, what they're doing for enculturation, if when you talk about so many priests coming from other countries to be in the church, yeah. what are they doing to, to help them integrate into a new culture, language, everything? Because that is an issue for Canadians. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's a very uh, an excellent point, and I would say it was it has been one of the failures. Uh, at the moment, people came; they there was almost an expectation that they would somehow imbibe the culture and fall into it naturally. But that hasn't been the case. So I would say uh, that has been a failing on the part of uh, the, the church in Ireland that it hasn't adequately allowed for induction and some kind of, your word, enculturation into how we, we, we do things here. A, a classic example would be, uh, say, people who would, a priest who would have come from Africa, maybe Nigeria or a country like that, who would still be kind of um, used to the cultic model of priesthood where the people come to the priest 
rather than the priests come to them. I don't think they were uh, formed enough in, in that sense. So I'd say we've done it badly, but we're learning from our, 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 our mistakes. Another issue would be, and uh, this is difficulty, would be um, language. Very Sometimes uh, the use of English would not be as proficient perhaps as it should be because there's a certain desperation. We don't have people anymore and don't have priests. So it's almost like, well, we, we take what we can get. So perhaps we haven't been as prudent in our selection process as we should have been. And again, maybe the religious orders have been better at this because they have been more used to working in that kind of culture. And they, so we could learn a lot, a lot from, from them. But uh, if you're marking us out of 10 at the moment, I'd say we have maybe three or four out of 10 in terms of our induction. We haven't handled it well, but uh, we're learning. As we are. Nancy. Um, hello. Um, during the sen Senate, the, your, the Senate process, um, I found where I am in PEI that most of the, the Senate uh, activity happened in those uh, ecclesiastical uh, groups that have formed outside of the parishes and outside of the yeah. congregation, and um, and and that's because they were they were already the spirit was calling them to actually have have uh, have a, a conversation right. Um, but one of the problems that and I see so so the synod process was really good if they could be if they could find a place after after um, t telling the church how they feel a place back in the church to be listened to and to to be part of it um, the the problem I'm seeing is that all all these groups are developing a hierarchy because they have, they're basically mini churches, right? And the hierarchy starts off in the community, then it goes into national, then international. And there's the, be the best people are, that's what they have to put their time. And that spiritual work suffers. And, and it's, it, it's, the, it's really inconceivable to me that we already have a structure in the church that can, bring that can can give people a place that but we have to develop all these structures it's a waste of energy and it takes you away from the work of the spirit and so the church has to wake up yeah, yeah thank you I, I don't know what i said earlier but for example um one of the startling moments for the church and i mean the institutional church was in the early 1980s when John Paul II was about to visit Spain. And they discovered at that time to their horror that something like 45% of all Spanish Catholics related to the church through a movement rather than through a parish. Now that, that was a real wake up call because no one had seen that coming. They said, where did this come from? And, and how did we miss this? And uh, so that, that's that's a real, and again, that raises questions about uh, the future of parish, perhaps against a new movement, because the new movements are very good in bringing people to that encounter with Christ, uh, giving them responsibility, and uh, setting people out to to go and work at the at the chalk face. Now, the point you make about structures begin to create hierarchies of their own is a really good one because I read a criticism of the new movements, particularly around synodality, that it's because they are much better geared at the moment and because they're more experienced in this kind of dynamic, in order almost to have your voice heard within the synodal process, you need to belong to one of these movements because they are much more proficient than say the ordinary, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but the ordinary person in, in, in the street. And, Part of the difficulty within the synodal process at the moment is that we are still talking primarily with people who are in the church, who are, you know, like people like yourselves who are here or engaged, but the, the people who have disengaged from the church, we're not hearing them. And uh, perhaps at the moment, the conversation is skewed in favor of the faithful rather than maybe a large number of people who are not part of the church and they uh, have not been able to or decided not 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 to engage and um, but the danger of structures superseding life and by the way it's a phrase that i heard 
Cardinal Ratzinger used at a, at a talk that he gave, which I was at before he became Pope. And he used that lovely phrase. He said, organization must follow life, not the other way around. And I like that very much. He was always saying that the structure needs to come after life. Let life happen first and then put a structure to protect that. If I could just make a point, I'd, I'd want the people to, to have a chance to come in again, but I, I should have said this earlier. We grew up in a Petrine model of church where the institution was very, very strong. The, the Pope, the Bishop, the, the old hierarchy was really so strong. Now, the Petrine was so strong that it actually damaged the Marian model of church. Now, Marian is the charismatic model of church, not just Marian devotion, but Mary was some was the one who gave birth to Christ. And Mary is always giving birth to Christ. So in, in the Marian dimension of church is where their life is taking place. Where is the life? What's dead? What's dying? And where's life? Now Mary is always giving birth to Jesus somewhere. So where's the Marian dimension of church? The Petrine church is meant to serve the Marian. This is really important. By the way, this is not my theology. This is Balthazar's theology. Hans Urs von Balthazar was a great Swiss theologian. And uh, he, he talked about this a lot. But it's simplifying it down. There's a Petrine model of church. There's a Marian model of church. The Petrine, which is the structure, the institution, is meant to serve the Marian, to give life. If you go to the Thessalonians, where... Paul admonishes, he says, to, mainly to the bishop, test everything, hold fast to what is good, but do not stifle the spirit. That's the responsibility of leadership. Test everything. Some things can be wrong. And the new movements, by the way, have had their share of horrendous things that have gone wrong. Terrible things have happened under the new movements. Masiel Masado, the founder of the Legionaries of Christ, one of the biggest providers of priests to the church, was a scoundrel. Uh, did all kinds of very, we're talking about sex abuse earlier, sexually abused people, had children outside of all kinds of things. Um, and it, it it was so profound that a question was asked about whether the order could, con could continue or not. If something, if there's so many things wrong, uh, for example, can, can a charism do evil? The answer to that would be no. A, a charism cannot commit evil if it's a true charism. Now, we all can commit evil ourselves because we're human and we sin. But uh, this, the scandal was so great here that the church seriously considered closing that movement down. And, and uh, anyway, that, that's by the, by the way. But that question, at the, and at the moment, what is happening, I think, in the church is that the Marian is beginning to turn that thing around, where the Marian is getting its proper place and the Petrine is meant to serve the Marian. And to be fair to Francis, he's a most humble man. And he is trying to do that. But it's like trying to turn a huge tanker around in a very small space. It's very, very difficult. It's inching. But that's what's happening. And the baptism versus ordination debate that's going on in the background, too, all of that is happening at the moment. Because if baptism becomes the primary sacrament for ministry again, that's the Marian. We're all called to ministry. And that's what's happening. Tony Andrew asks how much pushback is being experienced against new or previously underutilized ecclesial mo models. And also what about priest shortages within these new movements? What is the degree concern that there will simply not be enough priests? Yeah, well, within the new movements, one of the reasons why the, the new movements have gained pretty quick acceptance. And again, if I take an example, the Emmanuel community in France, which was founded by uh, a lay celibate, an elder lay celibate by the name of Pierre Goussard, who was a most eminent film critic. And his life and that of a young French doctor, Martine Cata, a young woman, uh, not too long married, they, they met and as part of a little prayer cynical. And, uh, and uh, they actually founded this new movement called the Emmanuel. Now, it's still very vibrant uh, in France and across the world, but the French church began to pay particular attention because very quickly it was providing priests to the French church, which was, as you know, the French church was quite moribund at the time. And uh, so th th that the church got very excited about this, that uh, it was providing priests. And that was one of the first things that uh, caused it to pay attention. One of the interesting developments in terms of structure was that when pr priests from this group 
got ready for ordination, there was a, an equal dialogue. Now we're talking about 30, 40 years ago. There was an equal dialogue between the bishop of the diocese and the leader of the new community who was a layman about where the, the young priest would go. It wasn't a decision of the bishop alone. It was a decision, a decision taken in conjunction, in harmony between the two. In my own diocese at the moment, we have a seminary in this, in my parish, a seminary belonging to a new community called the Neo Catechumenate. Would you have heard of that community? The Neo Catechumenate community was founded in Madrid by a traveling mendicant musician, a layman, Kiko Arguello, who's still alive, and a former. Uh, Novitiate in, in, a, in, a, in a convent. There's some, I'm not sure now whether she actually took vows or not, but she certainly spent some time uh, pursuing a, a religious vocation, Carmen Hernandez. And they came. And by the way, one of the interesting facets are, are of, of the new movements is that almost invariably it has been male and female. Now, sometimes a married couple, I think of one where in front of a married couple found a community, but sometimes not. Uh, uh, Kiko Argallo is single. And Carmen Hernandez is an There's no romantic relationship between them, but they founded this this uh, new movement called the Neo Catechumenate. Now they have a seminary in my parish in the diocese of Armagh, and they have now become the biggest provider of priests to the Armagh diocese, which causes difficulties, because there's nobody in this in the national seminary, very few. Uh, so we, we have no or very small number of priests coming out of the National Assembly, which would normally be for diocesan priesthood. And now we have a new religious congregation that is sending sem uh, priests to work for a time in the, in, in the presbyterate of the, the diocesan presbyterate of Armagh. Uh, a concern is what will happen over time if they become the dominant group, their religious congregation, not secular. Do you, would you, do you understand that language secular was the, the term we normally use for diocesan priests and religious congregation priests are are, uh, are somewhat separate. They would normally be on missions or have their own kind of agenda. But now they're becoming uh, the, the, the main uh, the main element of priesthood within within our diocese. So there are structural changes going to going to come there uh, too. The pushback would be a pushback around the, the kind of question, should we have um, married priests? What about, we have a, we have a growing number of uh, permanent deacons, married men, and uh, not enough, um, and again, a, a, a clamor for uh, deaconesses as well. You, you're probably aware of this from your own synodal um, uh, reports. And if you look at the reports coming in from across the world, those issues keep coming up that the, the pushback against celibacy as a mandatory needs to be uh, re-examined. So I think that's pretty universal. Thanks, Tony. I think we might make this our last question and then um, we're going to start to wrap things up for folks. Is that okay with you? Surely. Great. So Nikki um, uh, says that, um, I'll just summarize it, Nikki, that there's a despair about the ultra conservative mindset of the clergy, uh, younger bishops and priests, and the idea that Vatican II is a mistake, that we actually have leaders who are saying that out loud. Um, and so her question is, what's happening in our seminaries? Um, and why are we, um, why are they filled with professors who don't even mention Vatican II? And our disappointment this past summer as reflected in the liturgies that were celebrated when uh, Pope Francis came here to speak to indigenous people. So what's happening in the seminaries? Do you know? And what's happening in Ireland, maybe? Okay, well, there are, just to give a bit of background, Ireland, there are 26 dioceses in Ireland. Okay, I, was, I shared with Patrick before, one of the reasons we have so many is that at the time of persecution, every diocese had to have a route to the sea in order to escape potential persecution. So we have as many dioceses in Ireland, say, as Germany has. Germany is a much greater, I don't know many you have in Canada, but we have far too many dioceses. And, and at the moment, we, we have less than 30 seminarians in the National Seminary for those 26 dioceses. That's quite shocking because it takes seven years formation. 
So that should give you a picture of uh, things are pretty pretty drastic now. So so there are seismic changes uh, taking place. In in terms of uh, reaction against some people holding fast to what was in times of confusion, people look for security, and it's a kind of a natural thing to go back. and And uh, I know working with older priests, some guys take the, the view well, it's um. I'll, I'll get my day out of this, you know, it'll be, it'll be somebody else's problem. There's, there's, that, that, there's a group who think that way. But I think, I think the, the vast majority of, uh, of, to go back to what Donald Harrington said, the only future really is to explore, is to look and see, well, why is this happening? What is God doing? Where are the signs of life? Uh, what is the Holy Spirit in, in, in store for us? And we, we need to, uh, John the 23rd used to say, when he went to bed at night, uh, I've worked hard all day, now I'm going to sleep. It's your church, God, you look after it. And we know that the, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And there's, a, there's an old adage in, again, all these things are in that, in Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. The church is always in need of reform. And uh, reform is always resisted. The prophet is never recognized in his or her own lifetime. But, I, but there's a kind of a, there's an, an irresistible thing happening. It's happening. Like, just think, I don't know, just think of what we're doing here now tonight. This is a group of lay people. This would have been unthinkable, well, apart from the technology, for a group of lay people, maybe 30, 40 years ago, to come together and discuss, pray, talk about the church, that would have been almost unthinkable. And yet those things are happening now, not just here, uh, but, but all over the world. But it's really, like John Henry Newman said, he wanted an, an educated laity. And that's the big issue. Like one of the reasons why we have the trouble we have at the moment is that laity were infantilized. We weren't really given proper formation. And uh, now to some extent, that's our own fault. It was also because we acquiesced and handed things over and said, you guys get on with it. And uh, we, we abdicated our own responsibility. So I think that's the future. That's the hope. And the more informed lay people become. And again, even about canon law, it might be worthwhile, just as a possible future topic, to get someone to talk about canon law because it's the constitution of the church. It's quite incredible that it's never taught in our schools. And yet, you know, you're, you're the historic, the constitution of our country, all of the politics of our country is taught, and yet we don't know. We do civics here, and people learn about government and that, and yet we don't really learn about how our, our church functions. It's the handbook for the way the church functions. And the fact that you're only learning now that there are three other models of governance for parishes, even to say, well, why? one of the things that I would have said constantly, why are we not trying this? Why are we not piloting this somewhere? Okay, and not knocking, taking people in from outside. But, but giving people three or four parishes, why would we not consider learning from the missions or whatever and saying we can trust this to some kind of competent layman or woman? Now, that conversation is beginning to happen now, but, but it takes time. And I think that will happen. So the naysayers, the people who try to block, no, uh, you know, trust in, trust in the ongoing work, ongoing work of the spirit. Those who deplore, those who ignore, those who are trying to restore, waste of energy, waste of time. Uh, you can't put your foot in the same river twice. Life, life moves forward. Thank you, Tony. That's a great note to end on. Trust in the spirit. Um, it, it's the others will fall away and we'll go with the spirit. So I want to invite Joy now, if, uh, if you're still with us, Joy, if you could. Um, uh, oh, and thank Can you. I just, I, I'm just going to put that up as I leave. I'm this is this is Balthazar. Okay. Beautiful. And thank you, Tony, for making the slides available. Um, we're, we'll be happy to post those on the website. Um, and then, of course, we're making this recording available um, afterwards. So thank you very much. I'm going to ask Joy now to, um, to make the official thank you on behalf of all of us. Well, it's been a great pleasure, Tony, to share this, this time with you. Uh, I wanted it to go on forever. 
<laughs> it was such an interesting presentation and so engaging. And um, I think you challenged us. Uh, it's not enough to, to critique. Uh, and I think that that wonderful, you know, uh, it's not enough to ignore or to deplore or to restore, but we have to explore. And also, I really resonated with your, of course, I'm a lay spirit, and so I really resonated with your um, emphasis on the recovery of pneumatology. Um, uh, it, we recently had a presentation by um, a wonderful spirit and priest, uh, Emil Malkai, who you may know, uh, on the fact that in the creed, uh, you know, the spirit gets very short shrift, same in the Gloria, you know, uh, and that really, really the spirit has been the poor relation of the Trinity for, for far too long. So I think that's wonderful. Um, and also the fact that you, you helped us see, of course, that Jesus was in, was in fact a very, the very nature of paradigm shift he, he, he represented. And also that we need to reclaim our, our lay uh, vocation as kleros and not lykos. The fact that the kleros were the holy ones who were uh, following Christ or attempting to follow Christ. And I think um, that is something that we all try to do, but we need encouragement. <laughs> And we need that ongoing adult formation that you spoke of. And I, I liked also your expression that we need to be FXCs. We need to be a fresh expression of church. So you gave us much to ponder, much to think about, and much to be inspired by. So I really am grateful for your taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Thank you so much, Tony. And I, I hope that we get to hear you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thanks, so I'll Joy. just um, finish up by saying um, we've come to the end of our time together for today. We hope that you enjoyed hearing uh, Tony's wisdom and that you're leaving here today enriched in your understanding of what it means to be church and confirmed in your faith and inspired to do whatever is given to you to do to build up the body of Christ in our place and time. The recording of today's presentation will take a few weeks. Uh, we do rely on volunteers to do all our technical work. So with Keith out of commission for a little while, it may take a few weeks to get the recording converted to our YouTube channel. But when it does, you'll, you'll be able to find it on the website. Uh, please know too that we'd love to see you here again on Saturday, October 29th for the official launch of our Synodal Report where our, uh, Archbishop uh, Paul-André Durocher and Kathy Clifford and uh, Sister Jeanette will uh, comment and respond from their place in the church about what we shared in our synodal conversations. Many of you here today were part of those conversations, so I'm sure you'll want to be there for that. And then a week later, we will have synodal stories of hope uh, from four dioceses across the country telling us what their experience of synod was and the hope that that um, has engendered. So please watch, the registration information will come out within the next week or so. So watch our website or your inbox. And uh, for the rest of the day, just God bless everyone. Thank you again for coming and uh, stay safe. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.